1-855-213-2138 or visit Prevnar20.com. It's time to think summer and all the fun things that go with it, like Leinenkugel's Summer Shandy. It makes any time of year taste a little better, and enjoying a summer shandy reminds you of all the fun that's to come this summer. It's never too soon to think warm weather and enjoy a summer shandy from Leinenkugel's. Cheers to the warm weather coming. Enjoy the great smooth taste of a liney summer shandy, the perfect beer to get us all in the right frame of mind and enjoy our weekend. Make any time taste like summer. Find Leinenkugel's Summer Shandy at your favorite liquor store. This is Weather and Ag in Focus with Bridget Riegel, Justin Storm, and Dean Wysocki. And welcome to Weather and Ag in Focus. Uh, it's about 106 on this Thursday afternoon. Temperatures are in the 20s. Across the area, however, it is a little cooler out to our west where there's thicker cloud cover. And temperatures there in the uh, upper teens to low 20s. I want to welcome you to Weather and Ag in Focus. I'm Chief Meteorologist Dean Wysocki along with our wonderful, talented Ag Director Bridget Riedel. Howdy, y'all. It's uh, not a bad day out there for, uh, at least in the FM area, but out to the west, out around Jamestown and points uh, south of there, they're already seeing a little light snow and temperatures in the teens. But Ooh, brisk. This is uh, the calm before the storm, I guess you could well, say. Well, which storm? Because there's one tonight. There's two of them. Okay. Yeah. What are the deets? So for tonight, we do have a winter weather advisory along and uh, south of the 94 corridor. And with that being said, that means uh, light amounts, about one to two inches of snow overnight tonight. Not a big deal and not a lot of wind with it. So, yeah. uh, you know, we've had that uh, two inch snowfall earlier this season with a lot of wind and that, cr- that created some big problems. But that's not going to be the case with this one. About one to two inches in the FM area and slightly higher amounts, maybe three to five along the uh, South Dakota border, stretching into areas around Fergus and Lakes country. Um, and then as we head into tomorrow, we'll see skies turn partly cloudy. We'll be breezy. North winds about 10 to 20 and highs right around 30. A quiet day on Saturday. This storm system is kind of slowing down a little bit. So with that being said, it means that snow is going to get pushed off till later in the day on Sunday. If you have any travel plans on Sunday morning, uh, even up through about lunchtime, I think you're going to be okay. But after lunchtime, that's when the snow spreads in, uh, and it'll pick up in intensity as we head into Sunday night and Monday. That's going to matter. It's Palm Sunday. A lot of folks have plans at church that's on, right. in the morning, et cetera. I, mm-hmm. I got asked about it last night um, at, when right. I was at services. What's I, our weather going to be? I think we'll be okay. Okay. Um, now, nice. it'll start earlier out to our west and okay. southwest, because uh, okay. that's where it's coming in from. So areas to our south and southwest, you'll get the snow a little earlier than we will here in the FM area. And uh, again, that will increase in intensity throughout the day on Sunday, become heavy Sunday night, and especially yeah. Monday. Monday looks like an absolute mess with 30 mile an hour winds whipping out of the north, occasional heavy snow. Uh, this yeah. is North Dakota. We don't ever get wind. Are you kidding? <sighs> it's, it's a first. It's weird. Yeah, it's so I new. Know. It's so new. Um, and it's total snowfall accumulation. I'm going on the low end of this. You're still you're gonna laugh. That's low. Um, probably about six to ten inches here. Um, wet, heavy snow. Well, that's not really gonna blow through snow blowers. You're gonna just have to push it. It shouldn't be that wet. Um, uh, temperatures will be in the 20s most of the event. So <laughs> the look it, I'm giving you is like I don't believe you, Dean. Yeah. Um, it won't be super. That it won't be that wet, sticky stuff. Now. Um, as it falls during the day, some of that might be once it cools off at night, then we'll get the lighter, lighter consistency of the snow. So we're, it's going to be kind of averaged out to be eh, yeah. not that heart attack snow you'd normally get. <laughs> so. I'd, I'd, I'd like to avoid that. Thank you. I'd rather have the heavy wet snow for the simple yeah. reason that it's not going to blow around as easy. That's but. true. But I do enough things in my day that I, that could cause a heart attack. I don't need to do that as well. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's just take that easy, shall we? Uh, so keep up to date on the forecast. And this 6 to 10 inch band is going to be widespread. Still looks all along that I-94 corridor from Bismarck through Fargo all the way down to the cities. Uh, and there's some... Um, there's some models giving us more than that, but I'm just I'm taking the the, the kind of the um, conservative route here with six to ten. We could we could conceivably get more, and there will be areas that get up to a foot and a half. Oof. Yeah. So okay. whether now you know the the track of this storm uh, is is crucial to do we get in on that heavy heaviest band? I think we're going to just miss out on the heaviest band, but 
six to ten is heavy enough when you factor in those wins. Okay. So well, we're going to keep Monday's a mess. Just Monday is a mess. Mark it on the calendar. Now, the far northern valley along and north of Highway 2, uh, they're going to get spared the worst of this. I don't think they're going to have many problems that far north. So um, we'll, we'll see. You know, we'll see the exact track of the storm. But uh, it hasn't even hit shore yet in California. <laughs> so okay. it's still out in in the Pacific. Well, it could really fall apart because that state always does. But um boom. Oh, just nailing them today. Oh man. <laughs> we need somebody to run this. There. Ah! There we go. So not quite, but thanks for trying. Eh, it was close. Better yeah, late than never. Yeah. Uh so that's the, just be prepared. Make sure your snow blowers are working. I started mine and I'm I'm glad I did because uh it was rough. <laughs> Bet. Yeah, I had to run. I know if John's listening, he's gonna he's probably spitting nails right now. He told me make sure you drain the gas out. I, and he, he spits I, I nails didn't. at you every day, so this isn't a surprise, he I'm does. afraid. Yeah. So he told me make sure you run all the gas out of it before uh-huh. so I I didn't and it was rough starting, but I, I ran all the gas out and put fresh gas in it. So <laughs> now it's now it's good to go. Okay. <laughs> so many things today. First of all, we have tickets that we are to give away for that's the spaghetti feed. Spaghetti this weekend, feed on right? Saturday, yeah. You, they can go. The weather's gonna be nice, so that's fine. We will have our Cheyenne Garden giveaway the garden trivia so we'll take care of that today uh, for those who are watching on our live stream we have a new mascot for weather and ag and focus <laughs> he is so cute so we had uh, <laughs> some guests join us from montana not that long ago that raise miniature highland cows the little highlanders are super cute i've been asked if they're just lawn ornaments or if they're actual <laughs> you know beef animals they are a, a cattle breed and so we now have a stuffed one that can join us uh, he'll live in the weather office i'm sure i'll bring him in whenever i'm in studio for the live stream we'll need to find him a name but i don't know what does he what does he look like oh man shaggy uh, Big Max. Bird, Max. Max. He looks like a Max. <laughs> you know, he, we'll have to find out what his heritage is, if All he's right. like Irish or something, and we'll have to <laughs> name him Guinness or Cooper Ooh, or whatever. Guinness. I like Guinness. <laughs> uh, now, you, All right, Max, you just got changed to Guinness. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. Well, how about we give away, let's give away these spaghetti. You, you want to do this because we're going to have another giveaway at the end of the show. Yes, that would be great. So, uh, for again, if, if you want to go to the spaghetti feed, this is at the El Zagos uh, Shrine Center uh in north fargo there uh these are uh it's for saturday march 23rd which is this saturday uh from 4 30 to 7 now here okay. you have to answer a trivia question for it okay you're really making them work this yeah time. of course i am this again the spaghetti and meatball dinner this thing sounds awesome these are 20 20 tickets and we're, we're giving you two of them so all right if you were listening yesterday you will know this answer um gary lezak the founder of the lrc mm-hmm. what city did Gary work in when he founded the LRC? What, I was paying attention. You, all right. What city was Gary working in when he thought, hey, this is something, and he kind of, now it's not, well. Can I, oh, wait, 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 I got it. The I first city where he, it was named, it was named the LRC by his bloggers in Kansas City. That's not the answer I'm looking for. Okay, but I will tell you that I um, kind of know and we've dropped. We've probably dropped this hint because I'm going to be going there very soon, like oh, in the next you? few days. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Dean, I'm going to be gone next Friday. Heads up. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Right. So for those who are wondering, right. that so, maybe will help you. I, I don't see that wouldn't have helped me because I don't remember you telling us you were going there. Hey, have we met? Do you listen to I, what I tell you? Sometimes. Seven zero one two nine three nine thousand on the Red Wing Shoe Hotline again for a pair of spaghetti and meatball dinner tickets here uh this saturday at the el zagal shrine center in north fargo what city did gary first spot the lrc okay it was coined by his bloggers in kansas city but that's not it he first founded this or first discovered this in this city where gary worked at oh i'm getting some messages um here electronically let's say digitally mm-hmm. and uh to the do you want me to tell you what they guessed if that was wrong sure okay so kansas city nope that wasn't it mm-hmm. uh and then no to his current city he's currently in he's in gold golden, golden, golden Colorado, Colorado outside of denver yes. it's not that so no. it's not golden nope. so uh gary he, he 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 found this when he was young in his career uh, i believe it was his first job if i'm not yeah because uh 
Remember, he said somebody dropped the f bomb on air. Oh yeah, and he and, got the job, and he ended up getting the job, and uh, his career took off after that. I was curious the word, and he wouldn't say it. So it had, now well, I'll never it was, know. It had to be the f word, yeah, I would think. So again, seven zero one two nine three nine thousand. If you have the answer to that, um, you can win uh, the spaghetti feed tickets. Man, that's good. That's a good deal too. Okay. So we'll wait for that, and uh, you had to be listening yesterday to. Uh, to catch up on it. Well, you want to hit an ag topic real quick here before we uh, before we shove it to break? Yes, I had to send the message o- or the answer over to uh, are, Jacob, our engineer. That is correct. So he wanted to make mm-hmm. sure that he had it. Okay, so we are going to be having our guest coming on very soon, and that is Dr. Emily Fox. She's with the Ashley Veterinary Clinic in Ashley, North Dakota. She does a fantastic job all the time whenever she joins us, and we always have a list of great questions for her. One of the things that... She's probably focusing on right now with producers, particularly some new producers, is we're in the midst of calving season, you know, baby animal season, mm-hmm. similar to our new little mascot right. here sitting and on the desk. And it's been a nice calving season so it's been far. been a pretty good season. But that doesn't mean that we can shy away from the fact that new calves need colostrum and they need it fast after birth because there's a couple of reasons why. Colostrum is very, very intensely packed with vitamins and nutrients. And also there is something known as the uh, immunoglobulins and it's known as IgG. And this is an antibody that most people are familiar with, and it's extremely important. One of the reasons why timing is so vital in getting it to new calves is that their digestive system only allows large large molecules to pass through their tissue walls for a certain amount of time. So in as little as 24 hours after birth, these openings that previously allowed them start to close off, and the calf can't absorb what they need out of the colostrum. And so calves should ingest about 5 to 6% of their body weight so that's about two quarts of colostrum on average, and they want it given within four hours, ideally within just an hour. Generally, that comes from the mama cow. If that can't happen for whatever reason, sometimes mamas aren't nice <laughs> and they don't feed the way they should. Bad mama. Yeah, then you can supplement that to calves as the producer. Make sure they're taken care of because we want to see baby calves grow up and to be really great big calves. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And we, and we want them to get through the snowstorm next week too, which I'm sure all of our... Ranchers are all prepared already for it, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, getting folks the extra getting hay the, out. and They are getting um, warned well in advance. So that helps mm-hmm. tremendously. And we're, we're glad to see that, that folks are paying a little more attention Good. and being ready. Uh, and not that they aren't always paying attention, but with a storm coming, never... Never when, doubt the effect. When it's the biggest one of the season. You know, when I first got here two years ago was when we had just a gigantic storm out west. We had two of them back to back in April. Uh, and we had producers that were having to convert their garages into nurseries to put calves. I've heard in, in, sometimes they'll bring them in, into the into the house if necessary. Oh, yeah. Too. I've, I've yeah. grown up with that where we'd have to bring a calf in to, to warm up. But that w- there were so many and it was such a big storm that uh, there was a guy who built a new farm shop out there by Bowman. And he didn't have a place to put all the calves, so they converted that shop. We weren't really planning on making it a nursery, but they did. <laughs> so it worked out great. All right. Well, let's take, let's hit American Ag Network. And yes. when we come back, we'll have Dr. Emily Fox uh, from the Ashley Vet Clinic on with us. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Quiet action in livestock trade as we wrap up our Thursday session. You're listening to the American Ag Network. I'm Jesse Allen with this market update. Well, as we wait for the final settlements here in cattle and hog trade, it's quietly mixed, much like the counterparts in the grain trade here today. Cattle futures had some strength, but that faded after the morning rounds, and we're finishing up uh, in somewhat two-sided action here on the day. Weekly export sales, beef was another marketing year low, 11,000 metric tons, down 2% from last week and 12% for the prior four-week average. South Korea, China, Japan, the top buyers on the beef side. Pork net sales, 33,800 metric tons up 36 percent for the previous week and up 10 percent for the prior four-week average three primary buyers mexico canada and japan now however that did not really help out the hog market on the day thursday as we continue to butt heads against technical overhead resistance here in this hog market port canal values at midday down a dollar 67 and 90 51 so that didn't help either on the cattle side Pick it up some uh, business here in cash country. Seeing some trade in the south, 188. That's about $2 higher than last week's weighted average. Seeing a little bit of northern dress trade as well around that 302, 303 mark. Now, there was a fire last night in the reefer unit at a national beast processing plant in Liberal, Kansas, but it should not affect production. 
Box B price is higher at midday choice up a dollar four. Three fourteen forty eight per hundred weight select up a dollar four as well. Three oh three seventy five per hundred weight. Hog prices in trends steady in Dorchester, Wisconsin, and Garnerville, Iowa, with barrels and gilts at sixty. Red Oak, Iowa trend is higher, barrels and gilts at fifty two. This is the American Ag Network. Hey, Peter. That's me, just an ordinary guy. Listen, quick favor. At least I used to be, before Spherex fungicide. With two active ingredients, it gave me power to defeat Don. Now... When you're done thwarting evil, you mind getting my cat out of that tree? Everyone thinks I'm some kind of superhero. And I thought I heard a runaway train earlier. So I get a lot of save them and fix that, and of course, epic hero montages. But hey, for wheat and barley quality, I'll do what it takes to save the season. Spherex Fungicide from BASF. Always read and follow label directions. Trains are everywhere. You should always expect one, even on private property. Only cross tracks at designated crossings that fit your equipment. If you don't fit, don't commit. Whatever you're operating, secure your load, raise your equipment, and avoid getting stuck or causing damage. Minimize distractions. Remember, noisy equipment drowns out the sound of a train. Unless you're crossing, always keep a safe distance from train tracks. Look. Listen. Live. For more info, go to OLI.org. Close live cattle April up 65, 188.45. March feeders up 70, 250.95. April hogs down 40, 84.90. This is the American Ag Network. Weather and Ag in Focus on WDAY Radio. Thank you for joining us here on Weather and Ag in Focus. So glad that you're going to spend your afternoon with us. And we are going to be joined by our guest, Dr. Emily Fox. She is with the Ashley Veterinarian Clinic. And Emily does just an outstanding job. We always talk her up when she's coming on as a guest because we have so much fun. And her knowledge is outstanding. Um, I can't believe she still wants to come on with us. I know. Some of the shenanigans we pull. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and I have tried to prep her with questions so she doesn't have to give us the look over the over the camera of what? <laughs> so, and she should because we actually have pulled that before. So a couple of things that I've gotten questions on, Emily, that I wanted to, to start with if we could. Um, one of them is tilting tables. At your clinic, I've had someone ask about this. Do you have the table where if you're going to put a horse uh, down for a procedure that you can actually like strap them to the table and lay them over? Or can you do that for cows? I thought I'd just let you clarify how all that equipment works at a vet clinic. Sure. So we have a hydraulic tilt table for cattle in the back. There are people who flip horses in tables. It's not something I would want to do personally, and it's not something we have the right table for. Horses, you can't really catch them by the by the neck, right, in like a hydraulic chute because of the way their necks are and because of how horses tend to react to things by, you know, a lot of the time rearing up. Uh, So it would be pretty dangerous to the horse. There would be a pretty serious risk of a broken neck. So generally, we don't uh, tilt horses over. Cattle, there's a couple different types of hydraulic tilt tables. Um, Some people also have manual crank tilt tables. I haven't seen one of them in a long, long time. Uh, We have a very nice table that we had made out of Pennsylvania. And so a cow or a bull can walk in and gently have its head caught by the shoulders, kind of by the neck. And then we have a hydraulic piece that squeezes and then we can start tipping them up a little bit. And then we actually have hydraulic catches to hold each leg so they're not flailing around. And then they flip all the way over so they're on their side, but they're up high. Mm -hmm. And then we can trim their feet. And so sometimes cattle will have an ulcer in their feet. Sometimes their toes will be long. Sometimes they'll actually have, um, you know, genetically long toes. Sometimes it's a little more complicated. Sometimes they have something wrong with their foot. Uh, Sometimes we actually need to remove a toe, but this allows us to do anything that we can to try to help a cow who might have something wrong with her toe or a bull who might have something wrong with his toe. It doesn't really work very well with little calves. We generally have to sedate them or rope their foot in a regular shoot because it doesn't get tight enough. Um, Our table was made for us by a company in Pennsylvania. It's just a couple people, Uh, but there's a variety of different ones. There's some truck mount ones. In the dairy industry, they also tend to have ones that don't tilt Uh, the cattle are a little more used to it. So they actually have ones that just kind of stand up um, and they can do the cows standing a little bit easier. Uh, That's not as common in the beef industry. Horses, generally, most people don't trim in chutes and most people don't recommend running horses into a chute. Uh, They they behave a little differently in the way their neck is set. You don't want to try to catch them by a neck catch. Uh, There are people 
who um, do things to horses in a cattle chute, but they run it more like a bison chute. They run it with the gate closed and they're kind of just running a horse that's not halter broke into a confined area. Um, and then they're able to work on them, but they generally don't like try to catch the horse. We did that when I was at the Bureau of Land Management uh, mm -hmm. as a student and I helped bleed some of the Mustangs. So we, we wouldn't catch them by the neck, but we just opened the side of the chute to try to get blood because there are some blood tests they have to have to make sure they're healthy. Ah. And that was challenging, okay. really, really challenging. You learn to stick them quickly because otherwise you'd probably get your arm broken. Um, but there are people that have some kind of contraptions for trimming feet. They tend to be things like, uh, you know, more like uh, stocks. Um, but honestly, most vets don't trim feet. Right. Um, that's more of a farrier's job. So that's well with, uh, beyond my purview. Okay, I have a pile of questions just based off of that. So if you're going to put an animal on a table, is it a better idea to sedate or does that depend on the procedure that you're doing? I generally don't sedate things for the tilt table. Okay. Um, you know, the, the challenge with the tilt table is time. You don't, when something is big, and this is true of horses to some extent too, you do not want to leave these animals on their side or on their back for too long because there's the potential for nerve paralysis, right? They're really big. They're putting pressure on that nerve. You know, I make a time limit. I try not to leave anything on that table for more than 20 minutes, um, but you really wouldn't want, I try not to sedate things. Every once in a while, we'll give them a little something just to calm them down. But most of the time they're restrained well enough without sedation. Uh, horses, it is fairly common to sedate them to trim their feet. Uh, either do standing sedation or sometimes people do have to lay them out. Uh, we do have a, you know, the ability here to do horse surgery. We have a hydraulic table to put the horses on once they're out and we have a hoist to hoist them onto that table for sure. say abdominal surgery. Although we really don't do much of that because we're not primarily an equine clinic. Um, but those are more how you would deal with a horse. And most people just for horses, most of the time farriers are unfortunately kind of used to horses misbehaving. And usually <laughs> if people want, if people want a horse's feet trimmed, generally the horse has some degree of value to them and hopefully it's at least halter broke. Uh, public service announcement, please, please, please halter break your horses. Uh, it really does help us help them. You know, even if it's just a pet in the pasture, if your horse cuts itself and it's not halter broke, it's very hard for me to help you or help your horse. Um, and that's also true with brood mares. I know a lot of people don't halter break brood mares. Um, again, if they have trouble foaling, if they have a retained placenta after they foal, uh, we can do a lot better job giving them medical attention if they're used to human contact and they are halter broke and we can handle them safely. That's a huge hope is everybody handling them safety. Um, we got two minutes before bottom of hour or we have, I'm sorry, I don't mean to talk like I just fell out of the hills. <laughs> we have two minutes. And one thing I heard you say was if you had to remove a toe on a cow, cows are cloven hoof. There's pretty much two toes there. Is this like a human being when you lose your big foot, you can't walk real well, you fall over? How does that affect their, their pattern of walk? It does a little bit, but they do surprisingly well because they have four feet to balance on instead of two. So as long as it's only on one foot, they're pretty good at compensating. It is obviously considered a salvage procedure, but I have seen cows go back into the herd and not only raise their calves, but live several years afterwards. We usually try other things first. That is a method of last resort. Generally, we'll try to pair out the abscess, try to save, you know, cattle have a, a three phalange digit. So, right, they have kind of like our fingers, one, two, three. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if, if the infection is down here, you know, which this part is all in the hoof cast, capsule, your kind of first phalange. Um, generally, if the problem is down there, a lot of the time we don't have to take the toe, we can do things. But if it's an ascending infection where it's gotten too bad or we don't think we can get it under control, we also sometimes try to arthrodese. So we try to fuse it almost like, you know, when they're fusing people, when they fuse people's joints, ankles, spines. Um, so we'll actually, you know, obviously we want to give drugs before we do this and make sure it's not something that they can feel, but we can anesthetize and then we can drill through and try to fuse that joint that can be helpful. Sure. But if those things fail, there is the option of removing the toe. A lot of animals are much more comfortable immediately. Uh, it removes the source of pain and also can keep the infection from climbing any higher. Uh, and it does often save the animal to, to be in the herd for a couple more years. Okay. That helps tremendously. Oh, so many more questions just pop out of there. And for those who have them, 
you can call us at 701-293-9000. That is the Red Wing Shoe shoe line. And you can reach us here. We'll get your questions answered by Dr. Emily Fox. Uh, Emily, when we come back from our bottom of the hour, I do want to talk about something you and I traded on text message here this week about mRNA vaccines and some of the myths that surround them when it comes to beef animals in particular. So we will do that when we come right back. Sure. This is a shout out to all hardworking farmers and ranchers. If you're looking for the cream of the crop in post frame construction, look no further than Thor Buildings. Because let's face it, having the right size building for your equipment or livestock is crucial for your success. At Thor Buildings, they'll design your building for max efficiency, customized to tackle the seasonal weather in your neck of the woods. Post frame construction tailored to your livestock and ag needs. Buildings built better, stronger, and built to last. So when it's time to put the hammer down, build with Thor. Visit ThorBuildings.com today. Day. There's no better place to watch opening week of the NCAA tourney than at Sweet Shots. Go to DJ's Lounge inside Sweet Shots and watch tons of games. And all day on Thursday, get dollar wings by the dozen. Enjoy the $12 lunch combo Thursday and Friday, a bucket of high noon for 20 bucks, And get $3 neutral vodka seltzers Thursday through Sunday. With a TV at every golf bay, you could watch games and hit balls all day long. Make DJ's Lounge inside Sweet Shots your watch party headquarters for the NCAA tourney beginning this Thursday. Sweet Shots, located in Fargo. Good afternoon, I'm Tom Tucker, WDAY News First. West Fargo police continue their search for a woman last seen leaving work in July of 2023. Authorities say Jeanette Warner left work on July 11th at 2.30 p.m. in her 2017 Nissan Rogue license plate number 261AZY. She was possibly traveling with her dog, a Chihuahua Terrier mix. Anyone with information on Wanner's whereabouts is asked to contact law enforcement. The Minnesota Department of Corrections has downgraded the license for the Ottertail County Jail in Fergus Falls. A state investigation found staff members at the jail denied meals and water to an inmate in February. We're told the meals were withheld after the inmate smeared feces in a cell and refused to clean it up. The jail's license has been reduced to Class 1 status. That means the facility can only hold inmates for 72 hours. And the chair of the campaign promoting the North Dakota ballot measure for congressional age limits is presenting his case. I don't really know very many people in their right mind who decided age 80 I'm going to run for Congress. The people that are running at age 80 are the ones who got elected at 50 or 55, and they've been in there 25, 30 years. Jared Hendricks is head of the group Retire Congress North Dakota. Tom Tucker, WDAY and WDAYRadioNow.com. Hey, it's Will. Whether you're itching for a career change or just graduated high school, listen up. Morton Buildings is hiring, and it's a game changer. I'm 23, found a gig with a nationally recognized brand, loving what I do, and making bank. Morton not only pays an impressive wage, but get this, bad weather pay, up to 100 hours. Quarterly bonuses, and last year, I scored a trip to Jamaica just for putting in the hours and being safe on the job. Why settle? Go to mortonbuildings.com slash careers now and kickstart a career that's not only great, it's awesome. Give the star in your life the brightest gift in the world. Name a star after them. This is Rocky Moselle with International Star Registry. For $59 and a call to 800-282-3333 or visit starregistry.com, you can name a star for birthdays, weddings, or even memorials. Over 45 years, we have named millions of stars for celebrities and individuals from around the world. The star you name will be recorded in book form in the U.S. Copyright Office. Visit starregistry.com or call 800-282-3333. This is Weather and Ag in Focus with Bridget Riedel, Justin Storm, and Dean Wysocki. And welcome back. I hope over that break you had time to go to mortonbuildings.com slash careers. Check them out. They might be looking for you to join their awesome team. They are a 100% employee-owned company. They have quarterly bonuses. They have great pay even in good wet or bad weather. Meaning if it's terrible outside, they don't want you to come to work when it's too hot, too cold, et cetera. They'll make sure you get paid for those hours that you may have missed at work that day. You can't beat that. I consider that a real bonus that right is, there. That's a big bonus. Yeah. And they do <laughs> quarterly, like I said, quarterly bonuses, but also uh, company trips, et cetera. So check them out. Mortonbuildings.com slash careers. When we were stepping away there for a moment, uh, we were talking with Dr. Emily Fox, our guest, and 
one of the topics that I wanted to bring up today has to do with a text message sent to one of our morning hosts. And on that message, which I should probably just pull it up so I can read it for what it says, um, this message was from a listener who wanted us to research and discuss, and they said this like it's fact, that they, please tell me who they is, are now injecting cattle with mRNA vaccines. A rancher posted that they injected his entire crop and 30% of his animals died. They put a vaccine in his crop and 30% of his animals died. Nobody wants to vaccinate something and they have a 30% death loss. That's not great. So I brought this up to Emily and we both thought, "Mm, that sounds pretty shaky, like Facebook true. So what are real vaccines? What are ranchers really doing out there, Emily? Sure. So uh, first of all, I just wanted to start with, uh, I, as I, as I told you yesterday, I'm really lucky enough that I actually was not on the side of social media that I saw anything about that. Uh, I did look into that claim. Uh, there are some vaccines that have been in very, very early stage testing, but I don't think they would just randomly go into a rancher's herd. There's certainly no, that I know of, uh, marketed vaccines currently that are mRNA based. Um, and I certainly don't mean to wade into that debate, but right. um, it's ju- it's a technology like any other technology. Uh, in terms of what we use now, most vaccines are either killed or modified slash attenuated live. And I'm going to oversimplify this, um, not to dumb it down, but because uh, for the in the interest of time. So if anybody has further questions, you know, do some reading on this because my explanation certainly will not be complete. But the short version is generally whatever vaccine we're using. Um, there are killed vaccines and there are live vaccines. Those are kind of your two primary things, right? And depending on how antigenic, how stimulating the disease that we're vaccinating for is, some things can be very successfully done as a killed vaccine, whereas some we don't get as good of an immune response with a killed vaccine. We really want to move to a live vaccine if we can. Uh, those decisions I make based on the herd I'm working with, you know, uh, also based on the organism. So, for example, all rabies vaccines in this country are killed. The reason for that, they're actually, that's not true. There is one kind of semi-modified live, but they're mostly killed and killed rabies vaccines are very effective. The reason that killed rabies vaccines are very effective is because, at least in my understanding, and I should preface this with, I'm not an immunologist, but rabies is this big bullet shaped virus. It's a rhabdo virus. It's very cool. It's very scary looking to the body and the body sees it. And it's like, oh my God, what is that? (laughs) And you tend to get a very, very strong reaction because the body is like, that is not supposed to be here. And that's, that's what you want right now. Adjuvants, you know, when people talk about, oh, there's lead in vaccines, there's this in vaccines, the adjuvant is something that is sometimes added to a vaccine to increase the stimulation to your immune system. So instead of it just going in there and a few of your immune cells saying, oh, I don't like that guy, you're holding up a big wanted poster and saying, everyone look over here. This is the guy. The next time you see this, it's going to be for real. This is a drill. Next time is not a drill you need to attack this thing. That's really what you're saying, right? To your body's immune cells in a very simplified manner. Um, So there are some vaccines that are very effective as killed. There's also a lot of vaccines that are live vaccines. They're not just the disease. It's a weakened weakened portion of the disease. Um, Sometimes they'll take the disease and inactivate it. Sometimes they'll use another disease as a vector and kind of slap a little bit of it on there. But what they're doing is they're using that liveness to be more stimulating to the immune system. But they've also put it into a situation where it's not going to be able to replicate or cause clinical disease. Sure. Um, And so those are your, your live, your attenuated slash modified lives and your killed vaccines. Um, You know, a lot of the bovine respiratory disease vaccines, they recommend modified live over killed. There are some reasons some herds have to be on a killed program. And those are separate reasons. You need to discuss that with your veterinarian, but generally buyers do like to see alive and that's what we're doing with alive. when we need to like mix the vaccine, you've got to use it in two hours. Um, So those are the the two kind of main classes of vaccines. There are also, in addition to commercially available vaccines, there are autogenous vaccines. So that's something, it's a big portion of what I do. Uh, And so sometimes those vaccines, either the strains in them are quite old because when those vaccines came to market, you know, they kind of have to keep the strains the same. So they're using an isolate, a bacterium, a virus from, you know, 1989, for example. I mean, there's a couple on the market that actually the isolates are quite a bit older than I am. Sometimes that doesn't work as well anymore. Sometimes, uh, you know, we all know that viruses and bacteria mutate uh, a lot. And sometimes those things are no longer effective. Uh, In those cases, there are certain situations in which an autogenous vaccine or a custom made vaccine may be worthwhile. 
Also, sometimes there are strains that are not in commercial vaccines, or there are a few organisms that there is no commercial vaccine for. They're very niche specific. They're not big enough to warrant doing the studies to be approved by USDA, FDA. So that's where autogenous vaccines come in. So I work with a company in Minnesota uh, that has a laboratory system. I, for example, let's say someone comes to me and they've got a lot of respiratory disease on their place. I like to do some nasal swabs. Uh, I'll pool those nasal swabs. So we'll swab 10, 20 animals. We'll have them put together, send it all off. We'll grow what's in there. If it's something interesting, we'll genotype it. We'll see if it's genetically similar to strains that I see in the area already, if it's something specific, and then we can actually make vaccines to go with it. The caveat to this is because they are not USDA, FDA uh, licensed in the same manner, I have to, um, first of all, I have to make sure that I am prescribing the right thing to the right place because it sure. is a prescription vaccine. And then also I have a certain burden of proof to meet with the state. There's quite a bit more paperwork and I do have to let the state know what I'm doing. Um, but I do quite a bit of work in autogenous vaccines. Uh, one of the main diseases that I do autogenous vaccine development for is mycoplasma. Um, and there is a little bit of a variance for regional strain variation. So I do have to have a veterinary client patient relationship with anyone I'm prescribing this to. So somebody from over West River wanted my vaccines, for example, and I did go over there, do some work on his place, make sure that we had a valid relationship that I understand what's going on at his place before I could give him these vaccines. There is, I can't just sell it the way that you can sell other vaccines at runnings, for example, we can't do that with this. Yeah. Um, yeah. But it's very useful. Okay, and Emily, I was reading an article about uh, the M the mRNA vaccine, and I think maybe this is what uh, the um, Bridget the the, the, the listener? listener was was worried about is is as these vaccines are given to farm animals, um, they're worried about it getting into their into their into the into their food system, you know, into the food system for the food chain. Um, as far as you know, is is that even a concern? To be honest with you, I'm not concerned at all about vaccines getting into my food. Um, that wouldn't be nearly as concerning as other things. The way that vaccines work, right? These are biologics. They're naturally occurring things. Um, you know, yes, mRNA vaccines. I, I'm not. I maybe misunderstand a little bit of the public fixation on mRNA vaccines, and I, I hate to tread on that because I know it is such a controversial issue but you know you're using your own mrna to make these vaccine to make these um, immuno responses so i don't i don't really know that i think it would be a major food issue i know usda fda has also said they don't think that it would be an issue in food um, and generally vaccines don't persist long enough what you're doing is you're stimulating the immune system to have this response and um you're not really you're not at leaving anything in the animal in the way that you would with other things. I would honestly be more concerned about, you know, if there are contaminants in water, those kind of things. You see those a lot in other countries without uh, safe water sources, for example, that could potentially persist in the meat. Um, but I wouldn't really be concerned about this. The other thing is there are established withdrawal times for drugs, right? In general, drugs, vaccines, whatever. Right. If you buy a bottle of something, it'll say on the back if there is a meat or milk withhold. Uh, those are established through real science. They will test for whatever it is. And if they were going to bring any of these things to market, there would be potentially a withdrawal time on them if there was any reason to be, and there would certainly be research into it. So for example, if I give uh, oxy tetracycline to a cow in a subcutaneous fashion, 28 day myth, meat withhold on that one. Um, there are other drugs that have no withhold. Most vaccines actually don't have a withhold because most vaccines cannot be found in the milk or the meat. The uh, exception is actually most killed vaccines, but it's not for the reason that people think. It's not because of the vaccine. It's actually because those killed vaccines are already mixed mm -hmm. and they have a small amount of antibiotic in them to preserve the vaccine so that they don't get a bunch of other stuff growing in there that you don't want in there. And so the withdrawal times, to my understanding, which again, I don't develop vaccines of that sort for a living, um, but generally the withdrawal time is actually associated with the um, antibiotic in the vaccine and not actually with the vaccine itself. Um, but I do think that we have a pretty strong burden of proof in this country for vaccine production. If you've ever actually read any of the studies that they do to bring vaccines to bear, uh, it's actually, it's quite robust on, at least on the animal health side. And I certainly won't try to comment on the human health side um, for the sake of my sanity, but <laughs> I, I do think that we do a very good job uh, making sure that we don't have. And if you notice, I mean, 
I can count on one hand the amount of vaccine reactions I've even seen in animals. You know, we, yeah. we have very, very well researched and robust vaccines. So I, I'm not concerned about that, I guess. That makes good sense for a lot of things. Interesting, yeah. So one of the questions I'd also gotten from another listener had to do with, this is way away from vaccines for the moment, um, bloat in ruminants because whether it's an old wives' tale or even an old practice, if you got bloat in a, in a dairy cow, you could put a needle in their side to relieve the pressure of the air in the stomach. And I just saw your reaction, Emily. So I'm going to say that's maybe not a good practice if we could talk about that. <laughs> I'm giggling a little bit because I just had a conversation with a producer about an hour ago and he said, should I, should I, should I knife this? And I said, no, no, no. I said no so many times on the phone. Everyone turned around. There are reasons absolutely to release the gas and to, um, to have to do an emergency ruminostomy or, or to knife a bloat, but they're very rare and it is uh, widely overutilized. And then sometimes I have to clean up what comes after. So I should talk about what bloat is first. So ruminants, you know, they have these four chambered stomachs, right? They're not really like our stomach, but the final chamber is the glandular chamber like our stomach. But the first chamber, the rumen, is this big fermentation vat. It's full of like microbes and fluid and like fibers from what they're eating. And that's how they break grass down and eat it, make protein, right? And so when we have a typical rumen, there should be a layer of fluid, there should be this fiber mat, and there should be a cap of gas. And that's kind of how it all sits in there. And uh, kind of like if you've ever seen diagrams of a septic tank, I mean, not that their stomachs are like a septic tank, but they sort of are, right? You know, you come in, there's the pipe in, and then there's this like, can go down and there's water and then there's like a mat of stuff and then there's air, right? So sometimes they can bloat and there are different kinds of bloat. And that's when the rumen starts to get too big. So the first thing you have to ask yourself with a bloat is what kind of bloat is it? Uh, is it a inflow slash outflow obstruction bloat, i.e. do we just have too much stuff in the room right. because nothing is going where it should go, <laughs> you know, because things have to keep moving. Otherwise, you keep consuming, drinking, eating, whatever you're you're going to keep filling up. Right. Um, do we have a bloat and do we have a bloat that is what they call a free gas bloat? Um, and that would be where there's just gas forming. The wrong microbes are predominating. Maybe this animal ate too much corn and now the, the bad microbes are growing too fast and it's filling up with gas. Those are the ones people think of when they're gonna stab it with a knife, which we can talk about in a minute. Uh, and then the third type, right, would be like a frothy bloat. They, that, they call that a legume bloat. I don't see many of those, but they're pretty common in dairy. Uh, you see them a lot associated with alfalfa. That's where everything gets a little off in there and they actually form like bubbles, almost like soap bubbles. Wow. And all three <laughs> need to be treated very differently. So first of all, you've got to determine what kind of bloat. Okay. But you also need to determine if it's primary or secondary, right? Bloat is kind of like having a stomach problem, right? A stomach problem can be a primary issue where the problem is in the stomach. Or you could have a stomach problem secondary because you have the flu, for example, which is not just a primary stomach problem, right? The, the stomach issue is secondary. Or you could be vomiting. You could be vomiting because you have a virus that causes primary GI problems. Or you could be vomiting secondary to the fact that you're pregnant, mm, right? So true. there's secondary yes. and primary disease, right? So in the same way, when we talk about secondary bloat, sometimes bloat is secondary. And I believe, you know, this is controversial, but I believe a lot of the bloats that I see in like feeder calves, especially if they're not being fed that hard, are actually like vagal indigestion bloats. So there's some evidence that if they have pneumonia or something else going on, that their wet lungs can cause more pressure on the vagus nerve, which is the nerve that controls stomach emptying, and that therefore their stomachs might not continue to empty. Um, so I see a lot of those. So when I assess a bloat, if I'm assessing a bloat, the first thing I want to do is I blot the side of the animal and I try to feel, you know, palpate. Where can I feel? Do we have a lot of gas? Do we have a fiber mat? Do we have fluid? Where is everything? You know, from there, that's when we have a couple options. So generally, I tell people to start by trying to let the air off with a hose, you know, orally. So you can sure. take if you don't have you know, ideally a veterinarian can do this, but a lot of producers do it as well. You know, if they have like a clean, you know, like a fresh hydraulic hose, like a little hose, clean yeah. hose, it's safe. You can take a piece of PVC pipe and put the hose down orally and you'll get foul smelling gas a lot of the time with the gas bloat and they'll yeah. deflate and it's great. <laughs> and that's the best first course of action always because there's, it's not, it's not going to hurt the animal. The methane comes off, everything's good, but sometimes those animals re-bloat. If they re-bloat, sometimes I'll treat them with pharmacologics for whatever I think the primary problem is. Um, 
if it was a frothy bloat, you know, then I would probably put, there's something called ferro bloat that can break up those bubbles that you can put down. Um, and then in addition to that, there's also, um, there's also a surgery <laughs> I can do. So for chronic bloaters, I do an actual, like a permanent stomy. Well, it's not permanent, it's temporary, but not that temporary. So I'll make a little hole in the hide, you know, we'll, we'll, do surgical prep, clip clean and, and numb the area. And we can do this standing. And we'll make a little hole depending on the size of the animal, anywhere from that big to that big. And we will actually sew the inside of the rumen to the outside of the animal. Um, <laughs> and the reason for this is, uh, so it will heal over time sure. eventually. Sure. But in the meantime, that animal can get over what's going on. Uh, they do very well. That's called a bloat surgery most commonly. That's what most people will refer to it as. And the important thing about this is getting that seal between the rumen and the hide. And we'll talk about that a little more because I think that's important. So your peritoneum, which is like the, that's kind of the line, it's a big term for the lining around everything in your abdomen, right? That needs to be sterile. And your stomach is an external organ. And I know somebody's going to get me on this, but it is. So is the uterus. So is the esophagus. Not that they're outside your body, but they are made to contact the outside world. They are ready for the challenges of the bacteria that you get when you eat uh, something you dropped on the floor that you maybe overwent the three second rule. Sure. Um, those kind of things. So the those... Um, those parts of your body are meant to, to handle that. And I know we have to go to break in a second. So I'm just going to briefly say you don't want to go letting gastric fluid leak into the peritoneum, right? Yep. The area in the GI that's supposed to be sterile around the, the rest of the organs. And so it's very important, whatever you do, if you can, to seal that GI lining to the outside and not let juices flow. And so that's a problem when you knife them. There are times when you don't have a choice. Look, if you see an animal on the ground, can't breathe, bloated up so big, it looks like it's taking its last gasps. Absolutely, find the side of that fiber mat, do the best you can, talk to your veterinarian, try to get the air off in whatever manner possible. But it should be a method of last resort. Dean, it's more than to giving them a Tums. I'm gonna tell you that right now. <laughs> okay, so we do have to take a break, but Dr. Emily, Thank you so very much. I will tell you that um, I've already got stacked up questions for the next go round that we want to visit. So for all who are here, please, we'll be right back. We've got garden trivia coming up next. We, do. we don't want you to go away for that. So we'll be right back. Pfeiffer's 2024 auction calendar is heating up. Join us in Bowman on March 21st, Sioux Falls on March 26th, and Steele on April 23rd. Ad deadlines are fast approaching, so reach out to a Pfeiffer's representative today to ensure your equipment is featured in these Pfeiffer's regional auctions. Pfeiffer's is also hosting an exceptional lineup of retirement and estate equipment auctions in Mandan, Beach, Bowman, Glen Ellen, and New Salem. For full details, information, and online bidding on dozens of land and equipment auctions throughout the Upper Midwest, log on to Pfeiffer's.com. Get $50 off your prom suit package. That's right, $50 off only at Halberstadt's West Acres Mall. For 2024, get a free tie bar and socks with your prom purchase package. Includes, ready for this, a suit coat, vest, pants, shirt, tie, and kerchief. All yours to keep. Our expert staff will help find the perfect pieces to make you look and feel your best. Suit up, stand out, and own your prom with Halberstadt's West Acres Mall. Picture this, you're basking in the sunshine, cozy at home in your basement, and suddenly, a thought. Am I safe down here? Hi, Lacey here to introduce Precision Concrete Cutters, the superheroes of egress windows. Installing an egress window will create an easy escape in emergencies and flood your basement with natural light and fresh air. At Precision Concrete Cutters, we turn dark and stuffy into safe and inviting. Transformation magic. Visit PCCND.com today because when it comes to safety, trust Precision Concrete Cutters. Ready for a career move with a company that values family and offers fantastic perks? Plains Grain and Agronomy is now hiring. They're looking for Class A truck drivers, custom applicators, and more. Join the team and grow your career in agriculture. Apply online at plainsgrain.com. That's plainsgrain.com. Start your journey with Plains Grain and Agronomy as a Class A truck driver, custom applicator, or one of the many other positions available. 
Your diesel truck works hard, whether it's pulling a skid steer, working on the farm, or driving to work each day. If it's not 100%, that can be a problem. Is your pickup not running like it used to? Now is the time to contact the team at ATI Fargo. They know Duramax, Power Stroke, and Cummins inside and out. Get your light-duty diesel pickup to ATI Fargo, where they have a two-year, 24,000-mile warranty on new parts and labor. Keep your diesel pickup working at its best with ATI Fargo, the top place for diesel pickup repairs. That's ATI Fargo. Are you tired of woke investment firms trying to push their political agenda onto your money? This is Brian Cronk, financial advisor at Collins & Cronk here in Fargo. If you are through with big East Coast companies and their ESG agenda, call Collins & Cronk for a consultation. See how we build a plan based on what matters to you. Call Collins & Cronk today, 701-235-0119. That's 701-235-0119. At Collins & Cronk, you matter. Raymond James Financial Services, Inc. member FINRA, SIPC. Collins & Cronk is not a broker-dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services. Old man winter's moving on out, and it's time to put a spring back in your step. Hi, Teresa here from the local Red Wings shoe store. And I'm here to tell you that Red Wings are not only for hardworking individuals. We've got footwear for every occasion. And here at Red Wings Shoes, we have partnered with Polymental and Superfeet to offer 3D printed orthotics. So stop on in and check it out for yourself at 3003 Main Avenue in Fargo. Red Wings Shoes for ultimate durability. Give the star in your life the brightest gift in the world. Name a star after them. This is Rocky Mosell with International Star Registry. For $59 and a call to 800-282-3333 or visit starregistry.com, you can name a star for birthdays, weddings, or even memorials. Over 45 years, we have named millions of stars for celebrities and individuals from around the world. The star you name will be recorded in book form in the U.S. Copyright Office. Visit starregistry.com or call 800-282-3333. Weather and Ag in Focus on WDAY Radio. That's actually a perfect sounder. It is. I know you like it. <laughs> yes. Trying to, uh, welcome back. One fifty-five in the afternoon, and we have our Shine Gardens trivia to give away for a gift certificate. So today's trivia question is, are you ready? Uh-huh. All right. This carnivorous plant is native... To the wetlands, subtropical wetlands of North Carolina and South Carolina. This carnivorous plant is native to the subtropical wetlands of North Carolina and South Carolina. Hmm. This surprised me. That's not. I did not think that this was a domestic plant that would be native in the U.S. I was surprised by it, too. Yes. That's why I called that up. So, All right. Let's go right to the phones on line one. Caller, can I get your first name, please? Steve. Steve, what do you think? The answer to today's trivia question is Venus flytrap. Wow, man, that did, that didn't even take long. First, Boom. <laughs> woo, man, good job, Steve. Did you have to Google that, or did you know that off the bat? No, I knew that. I got friends out there. Awesome, good deal. Well, Steve, uh, we're going to put you on hold here. Our uh, producer Jacob, he will uh, take some more information from you on how to uh, claim your uh, your gift certificate. Congrats, Steve. All right, thank you. All right, you bet. Uh, that was quick. Man, we didn't waste any time with that. That was great. And I'm thinking, he's got friends who live out there, and I'm thinking, what does that thing look like in the wild? Does it just jump out and go rawr right in I, front of you? I used to have one as a kid. I used to love watching that thing, man. <laughs> it did catch a fly, and it close up. And, <laughs> oh, it was awesome. I loved it. Uh, we still have some spaghetti feed good. tickets to give away here. And uh, what we're giving these away, you have to answer the, the what we had earlier, the trivia question. Gary Lezak, we had him on yesterday for the LRC. He coined, the, his listeners in Kansas City coined the term LRC, Lezak Recurring Cycle. When did Gary first, what city was he in, when he first discovered what now is the LRC model? Kansas. <laughs> Just said it wasn't Kansas City. I know, but also Kansas is not a state, so it keep up here, Dean. <laughs> no, not really helping so you today. For a pair of uh, spaghetti and meatball uh, dinner tickets for the uh, El Zagel, Zagel, sorry, Zagel. El, Zagel El Zagel Shrine Center. Again, these are twenty dollars tickets. If you know what city did Gary Lezak first discover the LRC? We had it on the show yesterday. We had the answer on yesterday too. We might have to finish this tomorrow. Well, we might have to. Let's let's hit an ag topic real quick, Bridget, unless we get a phone call. So Okay. All you, right. I'll let you choose. All right. So most people believe that there needs to be a bee 
in the hive. Uh, in honeybees, that is the case, but that is not the case in all different types of bees. And that queen, she actually doesn't do all the work. She's not really even in charge. All she really has to do is make sure she lays eggs. Whoa. 2,000 a day, North Dakota's number one state in honey. Oh, got to love fresh honey, don't you? All right. Well, we want to thank you for uh, joining us today on Weather and Ag in Focus. Uh, for Bridget and myself, thank you, and be sure to tune in tomorrow. Right now, the Jay Thomas Show is coming up next.